Hi, I'm Ted Wolf, presented by Guidewise. Welcome to the Implementers Podcast, where we connect you to the stories and insights of people who have mastered implementation. Why? Because ideas are easy, but implementation is hard. Join us as we uncover the secrets of successful implementation so you can conquer your implementation struggles. Welcome to the Implementers Podcast presented by Guidewise, where we focus on the topic of implementation because ideas are easy, but implementation is hard. Today, my guest is Willie Peterson, professor in the practice of management at the Columbia University Graduate School of Business. Mr. Peterson has a very well and very profound background. He's raised in South Africa, received a Rhodes Scholarship to Oxford University. He practiced law, and then he began his business career and became CEO of businesses such as Lever Brothers Food Division, Seagram's USA, Tropicana, and the Sterling Winthrop's Consumer Health Group. In 1998, he was named Professor of the Practice of Management at Columbia University Graduate School of Business. He has three books that he has published, Reinventing Strategy, Strategic Learning, and his latest book called Leadership, The Inside Story, which is where we'll focus a lot of our conversation today. And I highly recommend the book because it has an awful lot of wisdom and um, great advice for individuals running any organization. Uh, Welcome, Willie. Thank you very much, Ted. I'd like to start off with a quote in your book from Nelson Mandela, and he said that if you talk to a man in a language he understands, that goes to his head. If you talk to him in his language, that goes to his heart. And I would venture to say that you would probably add hands in that because you have so much about action, strategic learning models, and things like that. Give me some feedback. What do you think about that head, heart, and hand as a uh, metaphor? Yeah, thank you. That's an excellent combination of factors here. You know, what Mandela was talking about literally was speaking to somebody in their own different language. And uh, we need to also speak to people in their own emotional language uh, in ways that trigger action from them. So I like the way the connection between heart and what the hands do, but it's also a reminder that uh, the brains are our kind of governing motor that tell our body what to do. So uh, I think our hands function as a derivative of what's in our minds and what is in our hearts. Okay, so using that, continuing on that metaphor, your hands and your head and your heart, when you started your business career, I believe you were in South Africa. Correct, yes. What kind of challenges do you have learning to run a business. You were at a young age. You had a big position of responsibility in an organization. How did you use a mentor and how did they help guide your head and your heart so that you acted appropriately? Okay, interesting thing. My prior career had been as a legal practitioner. I was a lawyer. Mm -hmm. So I was uh, mentally trained, if you like, to follow disciplines and analysis and clarity of thought, et cetera, et cetera. When I was given this big responsibility for the first time within Unilever to run their foods business in South Africa, I was relatively young at the time, age 36. I felt inexperienced, uh, a little overawed by the challenges that had been laid at my door. And um, I tackled it as best I could. I had a theory of how it all worked. I looked at it as a game of chess that if I made all the right moves and everything was logical and everything was rational, people would automatically follow my logic. So we back to this idea of hearts and minds and hands here. And, and I was driven by the rational side. of it. And an interesting thing happened. Um, after three months, my boss, the chairman of the group, a guy called C.J. van Jarsveld, a very influential character in my career, called me into his office and said, Peterson, let's review what you've learned in your first three months of being a CEO. What surprised you? And I said, you know, what really surprised me was how much of my job involved people and their human motivations and their personal needs and their needs of recognition 
and their need to be inspired by a large idea that was bigger than themselves. That was my biggest learning. In this mix of what to do, the human element looms very large in leadership. And he looked at me with a smile and said, Peterson, welcome to leadership. That was my first big lesson. It's about the people. Mm -hmm. So how did you carry that on then? Had the conversation, the insight came to you. How did you start looking at people and the difficulty that they have in perhaps managing change or implementing new projects, uh, something that affected their life. How did you start looking at people? Well, the biggest motivator of all is involvement in what people are asked to do. You know, the military is a different kind of organization, which is command and control. And we're trained that way in the military to follow commands, not to question commands, because it's all about unity of action and coalescing around a big idea uh, that comes from the mass commander's intent and then following through. Civilian organizations don't function like that. Um, I found the biggest um, challenge in running a business and getting people um, to, uh, to follow uh, you know, ideas and a, and, a clear, and a clear strategy was to involve them in the creation of that strategy and to tap into their ideas to get diversity of perspectives into play. Now, by definition, when you've done that in terms of getting the best ideas on the table, diversity of thought gives you the best ideas to select from. Inevitably, what you select then um, means that some people would disagree with your choice as a leader. But at the end of the day, you have to choose from all of that diversity of thought. And there's a pivotal point there from diversity of thought to unity of action. So what I found was a useful way to position this with, with people is to say, thank you very much for the diversity of thought that you've offered here. It has enhanced the quality of our decision. Now we have to all be on board to implement that decision. And being on board is how we behave after a decision is taken. That's what unity of action is all about. And you developed the concept of three domains of leadership that I think speaks to this same metaphor and that if you could explain that a little bit on how you integrate that leadership. Yeah, so Ted, you know, I think the first thing about leadership is that it's a, an intentional, deliberate philosophy of how we lead. It's not just a free-for-all, randomized exercise of power. Uh, or making grand decisions on an ad hoc basis. It's really about what uh, Marcus Aurelius, the Roman philosopher, called uh, having our own personal command center, our own individual philosophy of how we lead uh, that directs our actions. This is best to how we use our hands, our actions, and inspires others. So the first thing I think that's noteworthy about leadership is that it comprises three essential domains uh, that support each other, in that sort of aspect of mutual interdependence. The three domains briefly are personal leadership, that's leadership of self, being well grounded um, in our principles uh, that direct our actions and decisions and inspire others, personal leadership. Strategic leadership is the next domain, uh, which is providing clarity of direction for the organization and a very clear set of priorities. You cannot lead without that sense of clarity and focus. And the third domain is interpersonal leadership, which is bringing out the best in others. And I think what we're constantly doing with a framework like this is understanding how we can build on each of those elements so they mutually support each other, uh, so that we become fully integrated leaders, able to integrate those three domains. We're all human. We all have imperfections. We're always falling short one way or another. We're always confronted with new challenges that we haven't seen before and, and required to do new things. And we're always calling on one or more of those dimensions to put the main emphasis on in any given situation and bringing the others into play as supporting elements as well. 
And this has proved a very valuable framework diagnostically for us to understand what leadership is about and how we close the gaps that might exist in any one of those domains. It's a bit like an ecosystem. If one element of an ecosystem underperforms, then it drags down or destroys the performance of the totality. Integrated leadership, I think, is what it's all about. So take a look back on your career. Talk to us some challenges or difficulties that you and your team had to address and how you had to change and perhaps use your three domains of leadership to actually implement a project? Um, a number that come to mind, but let me try and uh, use an example that would be most useful. Um, at one stage in my career, I was the CEO of Seagram USA. It doesn't exist anymore. It was sold after I left to Vivendi in France, but at the time was the largest liquor company in the United States by a fairly big margin. When I was asked to join as the president of Seagram USA, um, first thing I did was ask for a trend analysis of its profit performance. And what I was shown was a chart uh, that um, demonstrated that the profitability had declined over the last four years um, by uh, something like 15 to 20% from 1.2 four years later. So clearly something needed to be addressed there to turn this situation around. Um, I put people into teams to kind of diagnose the problem. And what we found was uh, that some of the, a, a collection of what we called secondary brands with very low margins uh, were um, undermining the performance of the totality and distracting us from what was truly important, which is putting our focus on the premium brands that would drive superior profitability. So this was a question of trying to do too many things and hoping to succeed at all of them, and that doesn't really work. So the conclusion we came to was that uh, we had to subtract in some kind of way. These, there were 37 of these underperforming brands to allow the remaining brands to receive the necessary level of focus uh, to make this work. Now, there were a number of obstacles in the way, and they were loudly pointed out by the detractors of the strategy. First is, whenever you try and remove an activity in an organization, you are interfering with a love affair. Somebody is responsible for those activities and is passionately passionately supportive of them to an irrational degree. One of the very senior executives running those secondary brands uh, came into my office and told me that his father had preceded him as the head of that particular sales division. And now he was carrying on his father's heritage and that I was an interloper and a newcomer who simply didn't know what I was doing. Second thing he mentioned to me was that Sales of alcoholic beverages in the United States have to go through distributors. You can't sell them direct to retail. And he said the distributors will hate this decision of eliminating these 37 brands because they will have less business with us and pay less attention to our brands. And he literally looked at me and he said, you are new to this. You came from the foods business. You are destroying our business. Now, that was a formidable challenge, and it's back to kind of the emotional elements. People are in love with what they're doing, and let's hope so, because passion drives success. And secondly, there are always business obstacles. <clears throat> You'll never know for certain whether your strategy will work. I got on a plane with this detractor. His name was Jerry Mann. And we went to visit the main distributors in the United States, California, and Texas, and Florida, and asked them, what they thought about the subtraction of these 37 brands. Universally, they said, please do it, because they're cluttering up our warehouse, they're slow selling, and they're interfering with our focus on what matters most. Jerry looked at me, we were about to go to another sales area, and he said, let's stop this trip. 
I've heard what I needed to hear. Let's do it. I'm behind you. So that was an instance of winning the hearts and minds of somebody through their participation. I literally said to him, look, Jerry, if what you say is true, I'll take it into account. Let's test it out together. And we went on this trip. And after a week, we returned and he became a champion of the change. We ended up selling the 37 brands uh, to an outfit that really specialized in low margin brands. And the profitability over the next four years went up by 32%, simply because of our concentration of the few things that mattered most for success. It's a story of focus. It's a story of winning people over through their participation and involvement and the decision to be made. It was a big lesson. And then he finally committed to that, as you could tell when he said, I've heard everything I needed after the first yes. appointment, if you will, and he's ready to go now. Yeah. Okay. I could argue with him from an intellectual standpoint, oh, the distributors will love this because of this and because of that. But he needed to hear it from the – and they knew him and they trusted him, and he knew them and trusted them. So that worked well. Okay, so excellent example of the hands, the heart, and the head working together. And when that happens, implementation is a lot easier. Do you have anything in mind to uh, remember a challenge where you couldn't get those three things involved in the difficulty and the endless frustration of trying to implement change and it just isn't taking place? Yeah, and what I'm going to say probably will surprise you a little bit here. Uh, but when you think about, you know, you need sponsorship if you're really going to implement change, particularly bold change. People don't like change. They're in love with the status quo. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're asked to sacrifice the safety of the status quo and embark on some a, a journey with an uncertain end point because there's no guarantee in advance that your strategy is going to work. So the question of sponsorship then looms large. Now, what we typically think of in terms of sponsorship is leading down, is to make sure all of our followers below us are supportive of it. And I've just explained, you know, a process for doing this through participation, involvement, and that's where commitment comes from. We also have to do this laterally across different functions, bring those functions together as unity of, in, in the process of unity of action. Now, the missing part very often is the sponsorship from above. I think what inevitably happens when there's a major change to be made and we start the process of explaining it and then say, let's talk about it, is there's this unspoken question in everybody's mind. I wonder whether the chairman, I wonder whether the board really support this. Maybe this too will pass. Now, what I learned from this and what I always advocate to people is when you're launching, on a major, launching a major change, make sure that your boss, the chairman, whoever it might be up the line, who really matters, stands next to you when you announce the big change as a result of all the investigations that have been done. Then he makes a speech, he or she, supporting you. You write the speech. You say, I'm going to help you. Let me just draft a speech. Of course, you'll want to adjust it. People are very busy up there. They don't, they don't sort of sit down and think very clearly about the main messages. Help them with that. Write that little speech, that little narrative, and say, I hope this helps. But, of course, you'll use your own words. Typically, people will look at that and say, there are two or three ideas here, and I'm going to really support them. Stand next to you. Make that speech. And secondly, in the follow-up, and follow-up is always crucial, there are always progress review meetings, major milestone meetings. How are we doing? How's the implementation going? Where are we falling short? What do we need to do? Ask the chairman, the boss, to attend two or three of those critical performance review meetings, to encourage the heart, to keep saying, we can do it. That's what I'm seeing. Thanks for your progress so far. And the rule of the road there is celebrate progress, not perfection with these kind of milestones along the way. Well done. You know, as Virgil said, we can because we think we can. So for me, that kind of sponsorship from above is crucial. And if it's missing, I think we can get easily get into trouble because people are filled in with self-doubt. You know, is this going to be really supported from above? 
So that's a maybe an unexpected answer to you question that's very good be very good and serves as a good model to say if a project's not going well how do i correct it what are the steps i take to correct yes. it and get it back in line and on track and it really comes down to a lot of integrity and then getting everybody emotionally involved exactly uh, emotions drive performance metrics and numbers direct performance yes and then uh, you know the feedback explains your performance so if we take a look and try to segment just a little differently here into, I'm going to call a little bit more of the head part or the practical, rational yeah. side of business. In your book, you talk about a number of different biases, like the confirmation bias, uh, denial, things like that. In your mind, in your experience, how do they affect implementation and change or implementing change within an organization? In a profound way. Um, the truth of the matter is, when we think about our minds and our hearts, we are not objective thinkers. Human beings are not wired to be totally objective. Impulses, etc., are wired into us as survival mechanisms. If you're walking along a footpath and you hear a rustle in the bushes, you don't stop and do a situation analysis and wonder what it might be. You get out of the way in case it's dangerous. When you look over your shoulder and it's a rabbit, you might smile to yourself. But the next time you'll do the very same thing. You might turn around and say, that was irrational. No, it wasn't. It was a survival measure. Now, here's the issue. When we're making strategic choices in terms of what we will and will not do, that's what strategy is all about. Guided by insight. What are the choices we're going to make? Where will we compete? How will we win? What will be our key priorities? Those are really high stakes decisions that will shape the destiny of your organization. So if you fall prey to the biases that we're all subject to, they can derail our thinking and lead us astray. Now there's some stunning examples of how this can affect the performance of an organization. Um, I'll give you one um, of all the biases, the status quo biases, very prominent. You know, we cling to what we know and what is familiar. And this is a story of Kodak, who was an icon in terms of a, of a successful business in the US. Um, in uh, 1996, Kodak was the fifth most valuable brand in the world. It had 90% of the film market and 85% of the camera market. It seemed to be invincible. It was kind of like, the, you know, the unsinkable Titanic, if you like, in corporate terms. Um, and yet Kodak went broke in 2012. After 132 years, it went broke. Now, if you told me that before, you know, in, at the turn of the century, I would have said, but that's a ridiculous thing. How could it ever go broke from where it is now? Now, why did it go broke? Well, it was overtaken by digital photography. Aha, disruption again. Who invented digital photography? Answer, Kodak did. An engineer at Kodak called Mike Sasson literally developed digital photography for the first time. He presented this to the leadership team. The first example of it, the resolution was not very clear. They pointed this out. They wanted to kind of find all the criticisms they could. And he said, don't worry about it. I can fix that. In six months, you'll have absolute clarity of resolution. Not a problem, technically. But this is the future. They said, well, if we did this, it would cannibalize our existing business, which is one of the big cash flow giants of the world. Uh, Sasson said, well, yes, but if we don't do it, somebody else will. I said, well, not if we don't tell them. Now, he gave an interview to the New York Times. I'm quoting him here from his interview. He presented this to the leadership team, and the response ultimately was, I'm quoting, it's a cute idea, Mike, but don't tell anybody about it. So he didn't, and they went broke. Now, that's a startling example because you step back and say, how could that happen? Did Kodak go out of their way to hire dumb people who couldn't make decisions? No, they hired the brightest people they could find. 
it's never an issue of intellectual horsepower. We can all fall prey to these biases. So the status quo bias is very strong. Uh, confirmation bias is very strong. Confirmation bias, we're all subject to it. It's just a matter of degree. Confirmation bias is one where we approach an issue with a preconceived idea of what the answer is and then selectively look for evidence to confirm what we already believe and reject any disconfirming evidence. Now, there are many examples of that as well uh, that happen. And uh, I, I could go into them, but I mean, you know, we're all familiar with these. The point I want to make about these, and denial is another one. This is, you know, the climate change story, for example, denial, where the politicians don't like the science because it's inconvenient and costly to take remedial actions. They don't like the cure, so they deny the disease. It was very irresponsible because the simple answer is it's about risk mitigation. There's no certainty here. Now, if, you know, everybody's got fire insurance for their home, there's no certainty there'll be a fire, but if there is one, it'll be catastrophic. It's risk mitigation. But simple denial, you kind of a binary answer to it. There's nothing we need to do by way of mitigation. I simply deny that the problem exists because the cure is inconvenient. So um, there's only one antidote to these biases, and that is awareness. To enable us to monitor our own thinking and that of the thinking of our teams. So before we start a strategy project of any kind, it's a good idea to review these biases, get people to do some background reading about it, discuss it, make people aware of it. And then in, a, in almost a lighthearted way, we can call each other out. Say, look, this is the denial bias that was, you know, that's happening here now. Status quo bias, look at Kodak. Find examples. There's a wonderful book to read. It's called Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. It's a brilliant book. He won a Nobel, Peace, a Nobel Prize. He's an economist and a psychologist. And it reviews all these biases with some stunning examples. Now, I think to be an effective leader, we really have to have a working knowledge of human psychology, of the way our brains work if we, need to, if we want to make great decisions. Not a deep expertise in it, but just what makes people tick. You can't be a really good leader unless you understand that and how your own brain functions and your, your own thinking as well. So you mentioned in the book um, about um, you can have a very intelligent organization but the key to longevity is adaptability. Yes. How does adaptability work in with strategy in your mind? Well, this is an interesting point. I, I do mention it in my book. That this is probably the most important idea of all. Now, we work in a complex, fast-changing, disruptive environment. And a school of thinking has emerged in that environment that we no longer need to have a strategy because sustainable competitive advantage is no longer achievable. We just need to constantly innovate as best we can and find our way forward that way, but not have a clear sense of priorities anymore. That's just not possible because they're so short-lived. Now, I think this thinking is, in my humble opinion, um, highly highly misguided uh, because sustainable competitive advantage is not a product or a service. I agree with that. Those things are soon overtaken by events. Sustainable competitive advantage is an organizational capability, not a product. And that is the ability to learn and adapt as the environment changes. Now, I like to cite evidence for these uh, prescriptions that I offer. And the evidence for this uh, is, I think, incontrovertible. It comes from Charles Darwin, who wrote this majestic book in 1859 um, about how species survive, Origin of Species was the title of the book. And um, in nature, species survive through their ability to adapt to the external environment. But in nature, this is a blind, random process. It's not a thinking process. 99% of the species that have ever existed are now extinct. 
Um, in human organizations, our ability to adapt comes from our ability to learn. Learn about the external environment and the changes that are occurring. Learn about the needs of customers. Learn about the actions of competitors and what we need to do to outperform them. And use those insights to adjust and modify our strategies in terms of the external changing environment. Now, Peter Drucker pointed out quite rightly that uh, competition exists outside the boundaries of our organization, not inside. Inside is where we mobilize resources and count the money. Outside is where we create success. So I think that the, the scientific fact of um, evolution is that the external environment will never adapt to us. We have to adapt to the external environment. That is the governor that tells us what to do in turn. So my formulation of this is um, that uh, sustainable competitive advantage comes from our ability to adapt and that the lifespan of an organization is not a function of its age. It's a function of its adaptive capacity. And for this, we need to have a practical process, learning process, I call it strategic learning, to help us to do this, not just through exhortation. Systematic so, learning, creating an organization that is constantly able to learn and interpret, sense and respond. And that requires hardwired processes to do this. So, so I want to talk about your strategic learning model in a moment, but yeah. you have a very interesting insight about how you would define a value proposition. Can you tell us a little bit about that and how that differentiates your organization or an organization? Yeah, you know, there are a, couple, there are a number of things that get in the way of effective <laughs> implementation. It, it, implementation is a derivative, as so we've just described, uh, of focus and inspiration. That's where it comes from. It's a bit like the bottom line. Bottom line is a derivative of the things above it. It's what we do above the bottom line that shifts the bottom line. And um, strategy is the same thing. Now, so it's about creating competitive advantage. It's about doing something that differentiates you in a unique way that gives your customers a compelling reason to choose you. So it's about, and that's what Darwin would call a favorable variation that helps you to survive. Our favorable variations are our points of uniqueness that give our customers a compelling reason to choose us. Customers assess every choice they make with reference to the alternatives available to them. It's a comparative world we work in. So there's a popular phrase that's entered the business lexicon that creates enormous mischief. And that phrase is, we need to create a value proposition. Now, a value proposition <clears throat> is not a comparative statement. It's not a competitive statement. It's an absolute. It's a bit like the temperature. You've got high temperature, medium or low. And you don't, you know, when you ask about the weather, you don't say we have temperature today. It, it's a meaningless statement. If strategy is about creating competitive advantage and it's about differentiation, it's about creating a winning proposition. It's a proposition that creates that key point of differentiation that makes you unique. Now, I'll take a quick example. Amazon, through the words of Jeff Bezos, has a winning proposition that's very, very simple. It says, we make it easy for people to buy things. By, create, by offering a wide range of products at great prices with fast delivery. Here's the interesting thing about um, Amazon, its retail business. It does not sell a single unique product, not one. You can buy the same products at Walmart or any mass merchandiser wherever you may live in the world. What makes Amazon unique is its service model. It lies you know, in those other things, make it easy for people to buy things. This kind of a one-click process that they offer that's really unique and very pleasing. A wide range. I don't have to kind of walk around all over the place and find you're out of stock of my particular size or color, whatever it is. It's all there. It's very convenient. 
And they've got this wonderful thing of um, fast delivery. If you belong to Amazon Prime, it costs you a bit of money, but you can order tons of merchandise in a particular year without paying any delivery costs. The magic lies, and that's what makes them unique. Now, others have tried to copy them, of course. And so there are two ways of being unique. The first way is doing something nobody else is doing. That's how Amazon started, selling books online. Nobody else was doing it. And then people copy you. Now, the second way of being unique is doing what they are trying to do, but doing it measurably better. Customers love that, right? Now, you know, when you go on a flight, everybody's flying, right? We're going from A to B on an airplane. They're all trying to do the same thing. But some airlines make a lot more money, get a lot more um, premium uh, for the seats they sell, and are much more um, successful than other airlines, like Singapore Airlines, for example. It rests in their superior service, not in, oh, we'll fly you from A to B. Everybody's doing that. They're saying, well, we'll make that flying experience much more pleasant for you than anybody else would. And they do. So let's talk a little bit now about your strategic learning process. Right. As I understand it, it consists of two parts, a strategic strategy creation and then strategy implementation. Let's talk about the strategy creation. You have two modules, I would say, the learn and the focus. Tell us a little bit about those. Well, the entire process embraces four steps that work in a cycle and reinforce each other. The four steps are learn, focus, align, and execute, and then a learning loop back to learn because the external environment will not stop changing, so you dare not stop learning. So the learning part is your intelligence system that you have to build. Um, and uh, so let's first look at, you know, strategy the creation. Start with the end in mind. What is a strategy? A strategy gives us clear answers to three questions. This is the focus step. That's the deliverable we're looking for. Three questions. Where will we compete? How will we win? What will be our key priorities for success? Those are the three questions we have to answer and answer them with great clarity. If we don't have answers to those three questions, we can't claim to have a strategy and our organization won't know what to do. Where will we compete? Where will we not compete? What will we offer and not offer? That's our competitive focus. How will we win? How will we differentiate ourselves? and give our customers a compelling reason to choose us and what will be our clear priorities that help that winning proposition come to life every single day. Now, how do we arrive at great answers like that, those three questions? It's through the quality of our situation analysis. It's the same as in the military. Intelligence precedes operations. And then, of course, structure follows strategy. And implementation is a derivative of the quality and clarity of our strategy creation. So those are the first two steps. Now, if you don't have clear answers to those three questions, implementation is impossible because the organization won't know what to do. Of those three questions, where do you see businesses in general or individuals falling down? Complexity. The ability to simplify in a very complex, fast-changing market is a a leadership imperative to create that kind of clarity uh, that people can respond to. You know, the big question is, in their minds, what do I do on Monday morning that makes the strategy come alive? How do I contribute to its success? And people are paralyzed by complexity. Now, I, I I give you this example, you know, supporting evidence, if you like in terms of uh, clarity and and simplicity. And that is from Apple. Now, um, just to cut a long story short, um, Steve Jobs with uh, Wozniak founded Apple, I think, in 1976. Uh, uh, Jobs had a very abrasive style. And in uh, 1986, he left the organization and it began to descend rapidly deteriorating in its performance and it was by 1996 it was flat on the floor 
very few people gave it any chance of succeeding from where it was. And they asked Jobs to come back. So, well, can you resurrect this business? Um, I was a doubter myself. I didn't know how this could possibly um, succeed after after this decline. And he does a, he did a stunning thing. The very first thing he did was to subtract seventy percent, seven zero percent of the entire portfolio, leaving only four products. Then he built the whole turnaround on those four products to create an intense focus on those simple things. And Apple, from being almost dead, became the most valuable company in the world with a market value bigger than the Russian economy. Now, he ran the company like that consistently. Every year, he took his senior team on a retreat for three days. And he said, on day three, I want you to tell me the 10 most important things we should be working on in the future. They offered the 10. He put them up on a whiteboard. And he looked at the 10. And he crossed off seven. And he said, we're all going to be working on these three things. The others are off the table. And some people said, well, we'll put them on the back burner or what. He said, no back burners, no sideshows. Everybody here work on these three things. And literally said, if you don't want to work on these three things, I understand. That's fine. But I ask you to leave. And there's the door. Now, that's a bit tough minded. And not everybody can kind of do it that way. But note now, they participated in constructing the ideas. He didn't just come down and say, we're going to work on these three things. He said, I want your ideas. And he said, okay, there's diversity here. But now we have to go from diverse to, you know, to, to, mm -hmm. to converging. And these are the three ideas, creating that intense simplicity. So I mean, there's a mantra involved here in successful implementation in my mind. Subtract first, then multiply. If you're not really good at subtraction, I don't think you'll ever be good at implementation. That's back to my Seagram brand story. That's back to the story of uh, mm -hmm. uh, of Apple. And you've got um, General Electric, who went the other way, spread itself too broadly, and lost $500 billion in market value. They're now selling off all of its businesses, and it's just left with one, which is aerospace. So its business model was destroyed through complexity. So <clears throat> let's say that we have a fictitious company. We manufacture widgets, and it's the ABC Corporation. Right. Using your strategic learning process, let's say that they go through the learning part. They conduct the situation analysis. They define their strategic choices. They find their decision point, if you will, where to make entry. The next step that you say for implementation is you have to align your business systems. How would you counsel? How would you coach? How would you consult to somebody and saying, here's how you really need to build that urgency to change within that business system? Yeah, there are two things in the way, typically, of successful implementation. The first one is psychological elements, and I've dealt somewhat with that. These biases that get in the way of collective thought and create resistance, and we have to overcome the psychological aspects. The other is the operational aspects, is uh, what the military calls friction. We have to rearrange all of the kind of elements of our business system in order to tackle a new strategy. And the arrangements we currently have in place, and what I call a business system that supports our work, is really designed for yesterday's strategy. And uh, the key discipline here is to understand what that system typically looks like. It has four levers, typically. Measurement and reward system, our organization design and business processes. That's the second one. The third one is our business culture, our beliefs and our behaviors. And the fourth one is our people, which is their competencies and their motivations. Now, these four elements need to work together in a kind of symphonic way mm -hmm. in order to drive the new strategy and be realigned. Each element in, you know, taken and you look at the gaps and then you align them all up together. Now, take measurement and reward, for example. You mentioned this earlier on. What gets measured gets done. What gets rewarded gets done repeatedly. That's just the way the world works. Now, so often it happens that we change our strategy, change our priorities, 
and we leave the old measurement system in place, or it's not fully aligned with the new strategy, then that governs behavior. Measurement governs behavior. Measurement also is a communication tool. It tells the organization what's important. If you leave out a particular measure, you're saying this is not important. If it's misaligned, people are confused. I'm asked to do A, but you're measuring me for B. So that's the first place I go, and it's a very quick fix. Uh, second place I go is to say, are we organization fit for purpose in terms of the new strategy? Example, I work with a power generator in Arizona. One of the elements of its new strategy was to be more innovative, to go into solar panels and smart metering and so on and so forth. Now, the existing organization was built for operational excellence and safety. It's not designed for innovation, but you can't run a power grid by innovating and trying new tricks. You've got to be very, very disciplined. Answer, organizationally, was to establish a business a venture to tackle these innovative <clears throat> Uh, projects and establish a venture capital system of feeding it the right amount of money to support those ventures. There's no way that the mothership designed for this kind of very stable discipline and safety would have been able to innovate in a proper way. 3M, another very innovative company, divides itself into many, many different business units. And again, with the venture capital system to support it. So look at your organization design. Ask if it's fit for purpose. Then, of course, your your culture. You know, culture is instrumental. It's uh, they said, if it opposes your strategy, it, it it destroys your strategy. So, if your strategy requires a greater amount of amount of custom focus, for example, that needs to be supported by your culture. Culture drives behavior, and that in turn is supported by your measurement and reward system. Speed of decision-making, cooperation and mutual support. These are all cultural elements that help to support whatever you're trying to achieve. And then finally, if you, do you have a competency model? You know, sometimes I get invited by a company to help them develop a competency model before they've done the strategy. It's a bit like saying, I don't know what game I'm going to be playing. I don't know if it's ice hockey or football, but tell me what competencies do we need? You can't have the tail wag the dog. Structure follows strategy. So a competency model, again, is designed specifically to achieve your strategy. That's the alignment idea. It's not complicated. Uh, it requires a kind of a disciplined focus and an understanding of how our business system actually works and how it supports our strategy if it works together with all those pistons in a car like a car, the pistons are all firing in unison. That's the idea of alignment. Mm -hmm. So, what is the role of, <clears throat> excuse me, what is the role of change management in your experience while you are implementing or just moving an organization forward in execution? Yeah, well, you know, um, one of the worries about this is constant flux and constant change. And people say, well, I never get a chance to settle down. Um, how fast should we change? Now, you know, sometimes people ask me this question. Uh, is it a good idea just to shake up an organization for the sake of changing it, etc., getting it to think in new ways? And secondly, um, how often should we change? Now, there's only one answer to this question. The external environment will tell you. You don't have to tell yourself. Uh, there's a dictator out there. That's the external environment. It's back to Darwin again. So the, ans the question answers itself if you have an outside in focus. If you simply ask, what should we do? It will lead you nowhere. And you know, the worst question to ask when confronted with any problem is to say, what should we do? The world doesn't care what we do. They care only about what they get. So a better question is to say, what process will we use to arrive at a great answer? And that process is, almost invariably outside in. That's your dictator. That tells you how to change and when to change. Now, we need to be mindful of not destabilizing an organization, obviously, and there's only one way that I can think of 
and that it always to move from one focus to another focus, never to operate without clarity of focus. So it's not just a question of saying we need to change. It's we need to change from what to what and how and when. Okay. And in your mind, what is there the difference, if there is one, between implementation and execution of the business? They, they're one and the same thing. I think it's really about getting it done. Um, as, I, as I look at the kind of transition from strategy creation to implementation or execution, that's just a, whichever word I think they're both applying. Mm-hmm. Okay. The, the bridge is your priorities. That's the bridge because the priorities tell the organization what are the most important things we need to do in order to realize our winning proposition. Now, that's a static statement of what's important. We need to translate that static statement into a dynamic journey. And the way we do that is by taking each priority, defining the gaps that need to be closed from the present state to the future state to realize that priority. Now we're creating a locomotive, a journey, a set of milestones, accountabilities, progress reviews, present state is measured, future state is measured, future state is the one that brings us to the winning proposition for each priority. There's accountability, a gap champions leading this process. And so this brings you into a kind of operational locomotive, taking static priorities into a dynamic journey with milestones and accountability that lead you to the end point. When you combine that with the alignment system, you've got, in my mind, a pretty good uh, implementation approach, provided you take the people <laughs> element and the alignment and realize that you have to win hearts and minds, not just tell them what to do. So again, we go back. I, I, I love an African mm-hmm. proverb that mm-hmm. says, don't look where you fell, look where you slipped. <laughs> you, know, you go back and say, Did we slip because we don't have clarity? Did we slip because we didn't involve people and win their hearts and minds at the outset? You know, alignment, human alignment, begins at the beginning, not at the end. So it's it's that kind of process of involvement again. So if I may ask you a final question, what is it in your background that led you to, I'll say, fall in love with learning and become the person you became and to have the insight that you have as a business leader, because you have an awful lot of experience, but you haven't lost the touch for the heart, the people. And you've been able to combine that head, heart, and hand metaphor pretty well, obviously, from your experience. And that's very unique from an awful lot of large organization and small organization business leaders. What influenced you to bring those concepts into your mind and to actually use them? Oh, that's a very interesting question, Ted. Uh, It's kind of what makes me tick. I've I've got a curiosity about the world. Mm -hmm. Um, I was born and raised in South Africa. Um, In my bedroom, there was a world map. And I put a pin into the little town where I was born and where we were living. I woke up in the mornings and the sun was shining through my window, literally and onto that map. And I looked at that little pin stuck in this little place in this remote country. And I always looked at it with a yearning to understand the whole wide world, the different cultures, the different peoples, their different histories, and what we know about how the world works so that I didn't feel confined by this little pin stuck into this little place. That's how it really began, that kind of yearning, that kind of curiosity. Um, Then I began to realize that there was a connection between this and our ability to thrive in a changing environment. Depends basically on our learning effectiveness, both at a human level and an organizational level. And then in business began to create systems to do that well. I will add just one other thing, if I may, Ted, about learning. I'll make a confession here. I read very few business books. I do read business books, but by far the majority of the books I read are outside of the business domain. 
in the area of philosophy, in the area of astrophysics, etc. Uh, and I find that many of the ideas that I bring to play in everyday life and in leadership come from astrophysics or come from what I've learned about philosophy or studying successful leaders in other domains like Nelson Mandela. So to think broadly and outside our kind of just narrow little tunnel of what we do, I think is the key to success at the end of the day. The world is interdisciplinary. Well, I would thank, I, I want to thank you very much for your time. This has been a fascinating conversation. And um, if I may use the word role model, I think you are a role model that a lot of business leaders could look at and simply absorb some of your insight and wisdom. Again, I would like to also mention your three books, Reinventing Strategy, Strategic Learning, and your latest book, Leadership, The Inside Story. And I think we did get a little bit of the inside story, both from your philosophy of how to run a business in the outer game and the inner game of yourself, the learning, and how you can put all this together and build a very, very successful and meaningful career. So Willie, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. An awful lot of insight. And I look, future to, look forward to future contact. Thank you so much, Ted. My pleasure. Hi, Ted Wolf here. I want to thank you for joining us for this Implementers video. The Implementers podcast is presented by Guidewise, where we, along with our vetted member community, recognize that ideas are easy, but implementation is hard. To learn more about getting things done with Guidewise, please visit us at guidewise.io. And to conquer your implementation struggles, please like and share this video and subscribe to our channel. Happy implementing.